Okay. Oh, we're recording already. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my underground lair. Some of you I know, and some of you are new to me, but I look forward to many nefarious schemes and sinister plots with all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Evil. You are an unfamiliar face to many at this table, Agent A. Please, uh, the name is Big Anklevich. Uh, big by name, very big by reputation. How delightful. And the rather striking-looking woman sitting next to you? Rich? I understand she has a very unusual set of skills. Uh, can we stop for a minute, Rish? What's up, man? I can't go on with this. I mean, Clitoria Legrand? Is that a, a realistic name, e even remotely? Well, I think it's funny. It's gross is what it is. And Long Duck Dong, the Chinese henchman? No, 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 no. it's Long Dong Duck. <laughs> Don't you get it? We could change it to Kostin Van Dongen. Dude, this is just... Just what? Well, it all... Last week's Kukla Fran and Ollie parody... Ooh, uh, just Kukla and Ollie. There was no Fran. Maybe I'll just delete that before it airs. You better not. But before that, the Conan intro, the Bond one, and now Austin Powers. This is just lame. Mm. I mean, what is it? 1991? Austin Powers came out in 1997. What I'm saying is, nobody's laughing. You're just making us sound old. And next week, working the Dune Steve into a Planet of the Apes parody? Take your stinking Parsec nomination off me, you damn dirty ape. Just stop. Seriously. Can we go into the show like a normal podcast? Oh, how about, it's a wonderful podcast. Uh, announcer man, do your thing. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. He must be a loony. And Big Anklevich. I am not a loony! Hey, everybody. Hi, ah, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Uh, episode 132? Yeah. I am one of your hosts, Rich Outfield. And I'm the other host, Big Anklevich. Boy, it's been a long time. I suppose you could say it has. You don't think it has? Well, I guess Appliance of Science wasn't that long ago, but for me, it seemed... Well, you and I haven't been together Yeah, I know. For it's a long uh, time. Stuff has kept coming up. It feels like a long time. That's it's what she said. Uh, no, uh... Wait, no, I no, think let's announcer not get into man that. finally got it right, though, at least. Wait, it feels like a long time? That's no, what she no. said? No, Stuff kept coming up. <laughs> Ah, sorry. Moving on. Hello. <laughs> yeah, it has been a while anyway since we were able to get together. Things happening, preventing long trips, deaths Death. in the family, etc. But here we are, face to face. A couple of silver spoons, everybody. <laughs> we're hoping to find... No singing, please. Oh, come on. It's been so long. You wouldn't grant us just a little bit of singing? I can't take it again. Are, are we doing a story today or what? Okay. So we do have a story today. Yeah, that's what we do on this show. Stories. I think I read a comment recently where someone was surprised that we do stories. <laughs> you wrote that comment. It doesn't count. <laughs> no, I didn't. There's some <laughs> new person that I submitted a story to a contest. And I guess the contest moderator or whatever suddenly followed us on Twitter. Is that what's going on? Oh, and then he be. said something about like, yes, occasionally they run a story on there or something. The rest of the time, it's just Rish talking about genitals. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's like, wow, he, he's pretty accurate. He, yeah, he nailed it he, on he the may head. He listened to all the episodes, but you'd think he had. <laughs> you are worse than Hitler. So today's story is what? Today's story is Belief by Josh Roseman. Wait, that's the, the famous trombonist. Uh, no, no, no. This is the other one. Oh. But we know Josh Roseman. We do, yeah. Josh Roseman has been on our show several times. He's had a story on our show a few times. He won the first Broken Mirror contest, which I think is where we had his first story. Right, from. so he's the chemo guy. No, that's J.M. Perkins. Josh Roseman wrote 27 Jennifers. Ah, I have no memory of that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was 27 Jennifers in it. 
three gens and 18 and jennies. It was 16 gens, 10 jennies, and then there was her. Okay. I, it was my understanding there would be no math <laughs> on this episode of the Dunes All right. Who produced today's episode? Today's episode was produced by a brand new producer, Adam Gifford. This is his first go around. Now, did he have horrible disasters during his as well to prevent him from ever doing another episode (laughs) also he had to work with us which kind of counts as a horrible disaster in in most people's book but i don't think he did have to do it three times or anything like that as far as i know well hey thank you adam it's great that there are new people because the old ones have started to smell (laughs) no that's just me sorry I, i oh open a window man he heard one of our episodes where we said that we wanted, you know, volunteer producers, and he decided he would volunteer because he's considering doing a podcast of his own. He says he would like to learn how much work is involved. So I think probably by now he's decided not to do, to a, do podcast a podcast of his, of his own. own. <laughs> yeah, this is his first go around, and uh, I think he did a pretty good job. How would you know about the author? Josh Roseman. Not the trombonist. Yeah, right. The other one. Mm. He lives in Georgia. The the country? No, 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 no. The state. All right. Oh, this is going to be a long one, isn't it? <laughs> That's what she All said. All right. <laughs> His writing... Ap- <laughs> I think we ought to bring back the hate letter of the week. Oh, shoot. <clears throat> His writing has appeared in Asimov's... Once? Twice. And cross genres anthology, Fat Girl in a Strange Land. Oh, let's do the theme to that. Fat, Fat Girl in, in a Strange, strange land. land. His story, Survivor, made one reviewer, in her own words, throw the horns with both hands at the end. Oh. Okay. The devil. Oh, words? maybe that's it. She went, rock on. Cool. As well as in several other publications, including Medoon's Teeth. He is a reviewer for Escape Pod, a writer for Medzilla, and a performer whose voice has been heard on the Hugo winning Starship Sofa, the Parsec winning Pseudopod, and the Parsec ignored Dune's Teeth. No, no, we got nominated. Oh, sorry. That's actually what was written here. Parsec nominated oh, Dune's Teeth. Okay. He also has more than 10 years of assorted news, features, and sports writing experience. When not writing, he mostly complains about the fact that he's not writing. He's on all the major social networks, so go to roseplusman.com and pick whichever ones you like. And get social with him. Roseman. Sorry. <clears throat> so without any further ado, here's the story. Belief by Josh Roseman. Dad, someone broke the computer again. I tucked the phone between my ear and shoulder and leaned back in my chair. There was a lull in the noise, and I took advantage of it. What do you mean, someone? Sam sighed. At twelve, it was little more than theatrical, but I was glad he'd called me and not his mother. Ash sent me a file for a report we're doing. Oh, well, see, there's your problem. I waved to Joe, who was heading out for the day. She gave me a small smile. The last time I fixed your computer, it was because Ashley gave you a virus. I told you not to accept files from her. Dad! Now he was whining. I gotta do the project and her computer sucks. I shook my head. Ashley was Sam's first girlfriend, if a 12-year-old could have that sort of thing. She was leading him around on a leash, too. I knew girls matured faster than boys, but this was ridiculous. I get out of here at 7, I said. If you can get your brother to bring you and Ashley to the apartment, I'll make dinner and you guys can work on the project on my computer. Just check with your mom first. Sam huffed at me. You know what she'll say. The boy had alarming insight into the way things were between me and my ex. It's homework. You have to do it, and I'm sure it's due tomorrow. Hey, God, Dad. I'll check. I'm sure, I said again, stressing that part, that it's due tomorrow. Stress that last word, too. 
It still took Sam a second. Not the quickest on the uptake, that boy. You're right, Dad. It's due tomorrow. Can I come over and use your computer? Sure thing. What do you want for dinner? Whatever. Are you cooking? He sounded hopeful. Michelle had never cooked when we were married. I could be. Please. I made that little half-chuckle, half-laugh noise that no one's bothered to name yet. Ha! <laughs> sure, I'll cook. See you between seven and eight. And make sure, I added, that you scan Ashley's stuff before you open it on my computer. Okay. Normally, he'd have sounded long-suffering. But I think he was just happy to be having dinner at my apartment, with his girlfriend, and his mom nowhere in sight. I'll take it. Love you. He grunted, but didn't say it back. I didn't bother to force him into it either. Sam wasn't the only one celebrating. Maybe it was petty of me, but I was getting to see at least one of my sons before my official weekend. One per month, two weeks in the summer, two weeks in the winter. At least I got that much. Some of my friends and co-workers barely saw their kids. The phone rang. I sat up and answered it. Back to work. I know Sam lied to me. Hello to you, too. Michelle waved toward the interior of my apartment, but I didn't invite her in. Instead, I stepped out and closed the door. Your computer was broken. He had to use mine. He told me the report was due tomorrow. And you believed him? Why shouldn't I? Why would he lie to me about schoolwork? She slapped a piece of paper against my chest. I held it up to the anemic sodium yellow light above my door. See? I shrugged. So he lied. Is it so terrible that he asked for my help and that I gave it to him? Michelle sniffed. You bribed him to come over here. You know your computer is better than mine. And I can smell that you made him dinner. She folded her arms under her breasts. I knew that signal and leaned against the doorframe. She was settling in for an argument. <sighs> Damn it, Greg, you know the rules. And I'm supposed to ignore when my kids need me just because a judge said so? I tried to keep my voice level. I spent too many years rising to her bait. That's bullshit and you know it. It's not bullshit! She snapped back. You signed the papers, you had your chance, and you blew it. I opened my mouth, then closed it. We'd been over this ground before. Back in Baltimore, when I'd been a news reporter instead of an assignment desk jockey, the station had sent me out on a story. The court had changed our date. I didn't have any proof, but I was pretty sure Michelle had been behind it, and I hadn't found out until I got back. But she'd maintained her innocence, and I'd grown tired of her lying about her lies to me. If Sam or Dan need my help, I'm more than happy to let them come over here so I can help them. She sniffed again this time even more derisive. You've got them eating out of your hand, don't you? Don't punish them, Michelle. They didn't do anything wrong. She sputtered, but recovered. Didn't do anything wrong? I held up a hand. We're not married anymore. I don't have to listen to this. I'm going inside. So am I. And I'm taking Sam home with me. Michelle, don't be stupid. He's working on a project for school. When he's done, or when it gets close to ten, I'll bring him home. He'll be at your door by 10.30, I promise. I didn't like the plaintive tone I heard when I said that, but there was nothing I could do. Just let it go. Sam comes out now, she said, almost snarling. Or I call the cops and they bring him out, and then we see what the court says about your custody arrangements. I closed my eyes. Thanks so much. For? Reminding me why we're divorced. <laughs> Sam had been hustled away in a hurry, but Ashley had protested, saying she wanted to finish up before she left. Can you take me home? No problem, I said, flipping on the television. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, thanks. She disappeared back down the short hallway and into the tiny room I sometimes called an office, when I was feeling charitable. Sam had left a small stack of papers on my coffee table, and I flipped on an episode of Star Trek on my DVR, more for the background noise than anything else, before shuffling through it. Hey, Ashley. Yeah? She called back. What's this stuff on the table? Sam said it came out of his printer. At first glance, it looked like garbage text, usually the kind that wastes a whole cartridge and half a ream of paper. Page after page of three-digit number-letter blocks that looked like halves of hex codes. Later, as I drove Ashley home, 
I asked if she recognized any of it. No, Sam said it's because my computer has a virus. But I've been doing all that stuff you said I should to keep it secure. Virus scanner? Yes. Spyware eliminator? Yes. She drawled it. Firewall? Yes, God. (laughs) Sorry, I said, grinning. What was the file supposed to be? Our report. I left a copy on your hard drive, in case Sam needs to work on it more. My eyebrows rose and fell. Apparently, my son hadn't told his girlfriend that it was unusual for him to be at my house on a weekday. You can look at it if you want. Okay. I took the Excelsior exit toward Interlaken. We stopped at the hospital to let an ambulance scream past. So, um... You don't have to talk, she said, not unkindly. It's okay. And she took out her cell phone, clicking the keyboard, probably texting Sam. You see this? I leaned over to look at the other computer at the assignment desk. What's up? Frank pointed at his monitor. Shuttle's going back up. Now why do you have to do that to me? I moved back to my own workstation. You know how those stories make me feel. Oh, please, don't start. That teacher from Medina... I know, Frank. My fingers slammed keys on my computer, making it rattle and shift on the scratched, pitted desk. I hated being reminded of what I believe. When I was five, Star Trek came on every evening at six. My dad would get home from work and we'd sit and watch it together before dinner. Some parents bond with their kids through sports, but for me and my dad, it was Star Trek. Also, Saturday afternoon TV on TBS, The A-Team, Knight Rider, NWA Wrestling, but mostly Trek. And at that age, I wanted to believe. I would lay in bed at night, clutching my stuffed dog and hoping that when I woke up, I'd be on a starship, exploring strange new worlds, seeking out new life forms and new civilizations. I wanted to believe. I wanted to believe in a future where I could work with robots or join a ragtag fugitive fleet searching for a shining planet known as Earth or have a super powerful car with lasers and turbo boosters or even hang out with a group of ex-soldiers on the run from the government wanted for a crime we didn't commit. That sort of thing. Then came real life. Kids in my high school didn't think it was cool. They thought it made me weak and stupid. And by the time I got through college... Real life had taken over. Instead of the United Federation of Planets, it was United Healthcare. Instead of NCC-1701, it was 401k. And the only Dr. McCoy I ever met wore a rubber glove and told me to lay on my side and draw my knees up. Oh, I still believed. I still watched sci-fi shows, still saw fantasy and action movies on opening day, still tried to get my kids interested in Star Trek, but that was it. No aliens, no superheroes, no James Bond. Just reality. Dude, where'd you get this? Ben, the IT guy, was in my passenger seat. We were headed out to lunch, and I'd given him the inch-thick stack of paper to look at while I drove. My son. His girlfriend sent him a file, and it printed out all this junk. That's crazy, man. Why? Ben handed me his iPhone. I glanced down as we waited for a light to change. How did you get this? He shrugged. Showed up when I synced this morning. Any of the numbers the same? Haven't had a chance to look that close. Well, we've got time now. Ben took back the phone. I tried to listen to the radio, but all I could do was flick my eyes in Ben's direction every few seconds. Slow your roll. I'm checking. After another couple of minutes, I tucked my car into a parking spot around the side of the Longhorn. Well? Don't know, dude. It's just numbers to me. We ordered our food, and Ben slid the phone across to me. I started flipping through the pages, hoping I'd see a pattern. But nothing jumped out at me. Yeah, you're not getting it either. It takes time, I said, not looking up. Well, your time's up. The waitress was setting plates on the table. I handed him the phone. Can you email me that? Whatever, dude. I didn't think about the numbers until close to midnight, until I was at home on the couch, half watching the end of a James Bond movie on Spike. The credits started rolling, and I hit the Saved Items button on my remote, hoping that something might be in there to put me to sleep. Instead, all the movie names had been replaced by groupings of numbers and letters. 
I snapped awake and grabbed my phone, making sure I had photographic evidence to show Ben tomorrow. I also played around a little in the DVR menu. All the options had been replaced by three character combinations, but everything still worked normally. Well, I couldn't leave it alone, not after that. I shut off the TV and went into my office. Google brought me a surprising number of porn sites when I dropped in a few groupings, but there were some truffles in the mud, mostly in the form of cryptography and conspiracy websites and forums. I joined one that looked promising. One would think it would be harder to get into a community of paranoid people, and read through the thread called Three Digit Numbers in My Stuff. Members were seeing it in their email, on their phones, even when they tried to use their GPSs. I shared my own story and a few blocks of characters from the email Ben forwarded me, then went to the bathroom. When I got back, my screensaver had kicked in. But it wasn't the Windows logo floating serenely like it was supposed to be. It was more of the number-letter blocks, slowly filling the screen until they rolled up and off. I shifted the mouse back and forth a couple of times, then hit the space bar. Nothing. What the hell? After a few more futile attempts to turn off the screensaver, and more than one failed three-finger salute, I flipped off the surge strip. The code, that's what it had to be, some sort of weird code taking over my computer, blinked off. As it did, my phone trilled its email sound. More numbers. Another trill. Another bunch of numbers. And a third time. This is too weird. I switched the phone's profile to silent mode, dropped it in its cradle, and went to bed. Probably not the best thing to do, but I had to be up early for work, and no amount of numbers would change that. My alarm clock flipped on, barely jolting me out of the zombie-like half-slumber I'd managed after sitting up in bed for hours, poring over the paper Sam had left. Was it only two days ago? I couldn't even remember. I was so exhausted. Coffee. That would help. I ambled into the kitchen and started it up, then flicked on the little under-the-cabinet TV. It was only a nine-inch set, so it was hard to see at first, but soon enough, I had the big TV in the living room turned on. In the crawl across the bottom of the screen, in between stories about gas prices and the war in Iraq and the reconstruction of 35 West, I saw the numbers and letters again. A82. 10F. CC5 51C 909BA9 well, What was up with the crawl this morning? Anna didn't look up. Seemed fine to me. Really? Nothing strange? No errors or anything? She grunted. <laughs> if you count Diane misspelling a bunch of words, sure, there were errors, but nothing major. Anna was the EP of the morning shows. If she didn't see it, it didn't happen. What's up? Can I borrow your DVR? If you need it. She hefted herself out of her chair. It groaned a little in relief and clumped off in the general direction of the bathroom. I'd learned my lesson about sitting in Anna's chair. I leaned against the side of her desk instead and clicked back to 610 when I'd seen the numbers in the crawl. A82. 10F. CC5. 51C. 909-BA9-28C-8A0-219-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2019-2
We were a little too close for comfort in that position, but it was the last thing on my mind. I think it's a message. Four hours later, over lunch in his little cave of an office, bagels scrounged from a sales presentation, neither of us felt like going out, we set laptops up like a game of battleship and ran our number-letter combinations through a little application he'd written. How long did this take you? All morning. He rubbed his eyes. And most of last night. No wonder you look so shitty. You probably slept as much as me last night. Well, it took me until almost two to even think of it. Why? He smirked. I saw movie credits, first the names of the stars, then the crew, and finally everything was numbers and letters. What well, was it, View to a Kill? That was on last night. Ben didn't look at all apologetic or embarrassed as he told me what DVD he'd been watching, and he shrugged off my you-ought-to-be-ashamed glare. Like you've never. I didn't reply. He was right, but I wasn't going to say it. So you copied down all the numbers? Nah, I put the DVD in my computer and ripped them to my hard drive. The bagel was a little stale, and my jaw ached as I talked around it. What about the morning show? Did you pull that in, too? Yeah. There was a beep. Ben's eyebrows went up. Check this shit out. He turned the computer around. In a movie, I would have whistled to indicate surprise or shock. Instead, all Ben got was a quiet, Holy shit. You believe that? I didn't reply. I still wanted to believe the impossible was possible. No, oh, I knew it wasn't. I knew it wasn't possible for a man to fly or shoot heat rays from his eyes or dodge bullets or reverse time. Deep in my heart of hearts, I hoped I was wrong, but I'd long since downgraded my expectations. And aliens? At first, I'd hoped to be an astronaut or end up in Starfleet so I could meet them. But now I had a mental picture of aliens in Earth orbit laughing at us, or planning to invade. If they wanted to take over, we wouldn't be able to stop them. And at the rate we were going, sending Roman candles into space instead of actual starships, we'd never get to their planets. For years, I hadn't even considered that an alien race might want anything to do with us. But there it was on Ben's computer screen. If you can read this message, accept our greetings. Attend the sporting contest between the Twins of Minnesota and the Rays of Tampa Bay on the 194th day of the human calendar year. Inform your comrades so they may witness this event. What in the hell? Yeah, really. <laughs> ben forced a laugh. Who goes to Twins games anyway? A couple months, they could have seen some football. Yeah. I didn't remember picking up my bagel, but there it was in my hand. I put it back down. I wonder why they're talking to us this way. No idea. Maybe they can only talk to our computers. Like, maybe they don't talk. Or maybe they're deaf or something? It could be anything, I said slowly. Maybe they're telepaths, or they come from a planet where the air is too thin and sound doesn't carry. But I trailed off. I have no idea. We going to tell anyone? He didn't usually sound this thoughtful. I mean, who would believe us anyway, right? I shook my head. A couple of quick jerks. Has anyone mentioned this to you? Uh-uh. What about that forum you joined? I refreshed the page on my laptop. No one yet. But one guy says he thinks he's close. Most everyone else says it's a hoax. No way, dude. No way. I definitely agreed with him on that. So what? Do we get tickets to the game and just show up? I guess. He turned his computer around. You buy him? I'll write you a check. I paused. You think my kids might want to come? Ben slowly closed his laptop. You're kidding, right? I don't know, man. Another refresh. Nothing new. I mean, this could be historic, right? Aliens landing on Earth? Would they forgive me if they weren't there to see it? He sighed. <sighs> okay. A. We don't think it's a hoax, but what if it is? B. Terrorists. 
C, maybe the aliens are just trying to get us all in one place so they can blow us away or probe us all at once or, or whatever. D, that's a Friday and it's not your weekend to see them anyway. So do you really think your wife's just going to roll over and let you take them to a game? Do they even like baseball? Dan played Little League, I said. Sam doesn't like sports, but he'd come if I was there. How sweet. Ben's voice didn't lend itself to sarcasm. Seriously, not a good idea. Why not? We've agreed it's not a hoax. I'm pretty damn sure it's not terrorists. And as for them blowing us up... I shrugged. If they were going to kill us, I bet the message would have been more attractive. This is just like, come see us, please. Not, if you come see us, we'll make you rich. But what about Michelle? Maybe we can work something out. Go ahead and get four. Five if your girlfriend is coming. Nah, she hates baseball. Okay, I'll talk to Michelle. Good luck. Out of the question. Oh, come on, Michelle. It's one damn night. She sucked her cigarette like she was mad at it instead of mad at me, then blew the smoke in my direction. It's not your weekend. Hell, even if it was, you don't get Fridays. You get Saturday, Sunday, and Monday morning. I took a couple of steps away. Not because of the smoke. I just didn't want to be that close to her. Look, Ben won the tickets, so it's not like there's money involved. A small lie, but it wasn't as if Michelle had never lied to me. It's just something nice he wants to do. Why can't you accept that? Michelle dragged down the last of the cigarette, then flicked it out into the parking lot. It's very simple, Greg. If the game was next month, or on a Saturday or Sunday, you could take them. But Friday? No. No way. Can we work out a trade? She fingered the pocket of her slacks. There was a rectangular bump in one pocket that I figured was her pack. You couldn't have found a better time? You don't return my calls or emails, and the last time I went to your house, you called the cops on me for dropping off a book Sam forgot. This is all I had. I stopped pacing. Oh, smoke another one if you want. I don't care. That old snap, the same one I had gotten so often toward the end of our marriage. Apparently, I hadn't forgotten about it. When'd you start that, anyway? Why do you care? She didn't pull out another cigarette, just her lighter, which she turned around and around in her fingers. I don't need my kids getting sick from your smoke. At least you do it outside, right? She gave me a sharp look. Hey, I'm sure a judge would be thrilled to hear the primary caretaker started smoking after the divorce. I may not make as much money as you and Randy, I said. She winced when I mentioned her new husband. But I do have a three-bedroom apartment. Plenty of room. The lighter stopped spinning. Whatever. She murmured. Get them home by noon on Saturday. It was juvenile of me. And I knew it. But as I cut into traffic on the way out of the parking lot, I replayed that moment in my head. I finally had some leverage over her, and I could use it. Not even her parting text, you owe me one day of your two weeks in December, could deflate my mood. Aliens coming to Minneapolis and a victory over Michelle? Best day of the year so far. The seats were very good. Tenth row, a little bit past third base and Sam, at least, was impressed. I could tell Dan would rather have been out with his friends instead of at a baseball game with his father, especially on a Friday night, but at least he was keeping it to himself. Where's the bathroom? Sam asked halfway through the bottom of the third. Uh... I'm heading up. I'll show him. You cool with that? Sam shrugged, imitating Dan, who, if he noticed it, didn't show it. All right, bring me back some nuts. Ben gave me that goofy grin that said he was about to make an inappropriate joke, and I rolled my eyes. Yes, yes, D's nuts. I want D's nuts. Now get out of here. Ben looked like he wanted to pout. He hated when people stole his punchlines, but trooped up the stairs with Sam. Very droll, Dad, Dan said. Thanks. Glad you like it. Eh. There was a crack, and we both turned back to the field to see one of the twins knock one into left center. So, Dad... Dan said after a gulp of soda. What's up? What do you mean? I mean, why'd you fight Mom so hard for us to come with you to this game? (laughs) You think I can afford tickets this good on my own? I don't know. You work in TV. Right. I took a hit off my own soda. Short answer, Ben won the tickets, Ben and I are friends, and he invited us. Cool. 
Dan said, but in that unenthusiastic way all teenagers seem to say it. The inning ended. The twins trotted out onto the field. It wasn't until the second batter made it up to the plate that Dan, rather idly, not even looking my way, asked what the long answer was. My head snapped up. I'd been watching a pretty girl in an unflattering top sidle her way across the sixth row. What do you mean? What's the long answer? Now he was looking at me. And Sam was back, too. Long answer? What's the question? He dropped into his seat next to me and handed me a plastic bag of peanuts. Come on, Dad, he said, lips pressed together in disapproval. You tell Dad all the good stuff, but not me. What's up with that? Do people still say that? I asked, trying to stall. Dad! Crap. Ben? Ben shrugged. All yours, dude. I'm just here for the baseball. You're full of shit. Sam looked scandalized. Had I really never cursed in front of him before? But I could tell neither he nor Dan were going to let it go. I took a breath and looked up at the top of the dome. In a perfect world, or a movie, whatever was going to happen would have happened at that exact moment. In this world, though, it took until I'd explained about the crawl on the morning news. All around us, people were shouting, running for the exits, taking photos and videos with all kinds of cell phones. Sam looked like he wanted to bolt. Ben and Dan were with the cell phone crowd. I put a hand on Sam's shoulder. It's okay, son. It's okay. Okay? His voice was an octave too high. Dad, what is that thing and what's it doing in the middle of the field? I looked at the infield. The players had scattered, back to the catacombs of the building somewhere under our seats. The ship, it had to be a ship, it couldn't be anything else, had appeared out of nowhere. No noise, no lasers cutting open a hole in the dome, no thrusters burning the grass. I'd been looking at the girl again until someone had yelled, What the fuck is that? The thing was about as big as the infield itself. Rectangular, maybe five or six stories high. I flashed instantly on Borg ships, but this couldn't be the Borg. A, they were fictional, and B, whoever these people, or aliens, or whatever turned out to be, they had at least bothered to put windows and doors on the ship. Parts of it, looked like exhaust ports to me, were still glowing reddish with heat. The ship itself was a deep, silvery color, and it didn't reflect light. Flashes from photographers didn't shine back off the skin of the ship, but there were slight flickers of reflection from the windows. Dad... Dan said slowly, eyes wide and fixed on the ship. What the fuck did you bring us here for? Don't curse, I said automatically, my own eyes examining the ship. No, Dad. I think I deserve a fuck or two here. He looked at me, and he looked pissed. You got some weird messages, figured out what they meant, and decided you wanted me and Sam to be here when aliens invaded our planet? Is that it, Dad? Is it? Damn it, Dan! I snapped, finally looking at him. Don't you get it? This is... It's... Ben picked up when I stammered out. It's history, dude. It's like, where were you on 9-11? Or where was your grandpa when Kennedy got shot? Or when we landed on the moon? Stuff like this. You'll want to say you were there. Your kids will think you're awesome. My kids? He looked past me, and I turned. Sam's knuckles were white where he squeezed the arms of his seat. How many kids in here tonight, Ben? Sam's face was as white as his knuckles, brown eyes wide and glittering. I want to go home, Dad. His voice was very, very small. I put my arm over his shoulders and tried to pull him to me. It'll be okay, Sam. I'm sure it's safe. They, um, probably just needed a way into the dome. I smiled, but it felt fake even to me. Maybe if they waited a couple of years, they could have just come into the new stadium without worrying about the roof, right? That's not funny, Dan said, almost snarling. Come on, Sam. Let's get out of here. Where are you going to go? I drove. He held out his hand. Give me your keys, then, your new alien friend. And he choked on the word. Can give you a ride home. Dan, come on! I pointed toward the ship. They sent us a message. Look around you and think about the people you passed on the way in. How many of them looked like real baseball fans? He glowered, but I pushed on. A lot of people got this message. Why would aliens bother to tell us they were coming if they were going to kill us all? He shook his head. Give me the damn keys, Dad. 
I glanced at Ben, who shrugged again. Dan, I said. Please don't go. This is important. Important to you, maybe. He waved in the general direction of the rows of seats behind us. Look around you, Dad, he said, parroting my words and my tone. People are getting the hell out of here. They're scared. Even your conspiracy theory buddies aren't staying. Well, I... <sighs> but Dan kept going, raising his voice right over mine. I don't care who's in this ship. I don't care if they're here to give us warp drive or the cure for AIDS or what. You just dragged me and Sam with you because you don't think aliens can be evil. Come on, Dad. I watch movies just like you, but you're an optimist and I'm not. Dan. He got up and crossed in front of me to put his hand on Sam's arm. Come on, bro. We're going. Sam, you know I wouldn't put you in danger. I'm scared, Dad. I want Bob. I swallowed hard around the lump in my throat. Sam! He let Dan pull him to his feet. Dan held out his hand again. Keys, Dad! I gave them to him. Here. Thanks. He didn't sound appreciative. Just sad. Good luck. The stadium had been empty enough by that point that Dan and Sam had no trouble getting out of the stands. I hoped they'd be okay on the concourse level. Dude, that was harsh. Ben had his phone out, probably on the internet. Yeah. My own phone was vibrating in my pocket. I put it to my ear. Hello? What the hell's going on over there? Yeah, Michelle, I have to call you back in a few minutes, I said, voice dull. What about Sam? What about Dan? What the hell? I ended the call. Hey, Greg. What? Check this out. He handed over his phone. The CNN app was open. Dude, every baseball game in the country has one of these things at it. It's not just here. Really? Really. His forehead was starting to shine with sweat. I gotta get out of here. Something's not right. Fine. Go. Come on, Greg, let's get the hell out of here before it's too late. You go ahead. I turned back to the ship. I'm going to see what happens. He muttered something and ran for it. I don't know how long I sat there, watching the ship, waiting for something to happen. My phone was vibrating nonstop in my pocket, but I ignored it. There were a few people still in the stands. I ignored them, too. The ship would open. The aliens would come out. They would be benevolent. We would learn so much from them. We would go into space and join a peaceful federation of other starfaring cultures. We would... Citizens of the Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was coming over the speakers in the stadium. It was displayed in all capitals on the Jumbotron. Please inform our community and make way to our transport. You will receive further instructions once inside. I looked around. No one was closer to the field than I was. Not now. I jogged down the stairs and jumped the railing. A door had opened in the side of the ship, and I made for it. I couldn't see what was inside, but I didn't care. I believed. And now, a word about today's story. Hi, this is Josh Roseman. Belief is one of the first three stories I wrote when I started writing. Started is in finger quotes, by the way. As such, it has a lot of the pitfalls of a first story. The main character is a semi-idealized version of myself, and all the stuff about watching TV with his dad and later being forced to put his beliefs on the shelf? That's all me. Also, he works at CARE 11 in Minneapolis, and I used to work for CARE's sister station in Atlanta. Some of the humor, I think, doesn't work so well in written form. There are certain phrases, such as, slow your roll, Holmes, that just don't translate into print, although in audio, the proper inflection makes them work better. I didn't cut a lot out of the story once I finished it. I wasn't nearly heavy-handed enough with the editing. Overall, I think the story came out all right. I revised it twice before it finally sold last year, but I know I took too long to do the revisions themselves, and I think that contributed to how long, five years, it took me to sell. 
Finally, a bit of trivia. The original title of this story was, I for one welcome our new robot overlords. But when they turned out to be aliens, I had to change the title. Thanks for listening to the story, and thanks to the Doonstief team for presenting it in audio form. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Did you enjoy the story? I did. Oh, wow, we haven't had that in a long time. (laughs) Usually it's been replaced, rightly so, by the cast list. Oh, yes. Do we have a cast list for this story? I thought. Indeed we do. Yay. Nice work, Rich Outfield. Tie-dye flipster. Pay attention. Rish Outfield was the narrator and main character named Greg. Was it Greg? Yes. It didn't sound like a Greg. I would have done a totally different voice if I'd known his name was Greg. I played the character whose name was Ben. Jank. Jank. Don't break something, sir. (laughs) We've got a lot of recording to do today. (laughs) Shanky S. Carlo played Sam. The tie-dye flipster played Ashley. Michelle was played by Jennifer Gifford. Hmm. Frank was played by A.W. Gifford. Okay, uh, this is a conspiracy, man. Also known as Adam Gifford, producer. He also did random shouting. Yeah, that's why the baby was crying. He also played a guy, and he did the alien announcement. Anna was played by Gina Padilla. Dan was played by Joshua Porter. The famous big band cellist. No, 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 not that one. The other one. Ah. That's our cast list. Do we put links in the show notes? We never have. You know, if you want to go through the show notes, there's like bonus conversations and episodes and stuff in there. That's true. Yeah, there's links to all sorts of crazy crap in the show notes sometimes. Like last week, there was a link to us talking about... The People versus George Lucas, I believe. Yeah, that's what it was. We don't need another hero. We don't need no the We way don't home. need another way home. Oh, that wasn't it. I always want to hey, sing another note and I walk. Well, I, actually, I wouldn't mind. Oh, he has to do the legalese at the end. Yeah, yeah, we do need that. We don't want to have to say that crap. It's That's hard. Okay, so belief. Jeez, the first thing I got to say about this thing is this was one of the first stories he wrote. And it's been sold, he said, and it just got podcasted by us. Dude, if I put out one of the first stories I wrote, <laughs> there would be like a blacklist by whomever I sent it to. They'd be like, never read another story by well, this guy. They'd be sending it around to all the other publications too. Well, he did say that the first story when he started writing and he said it was in quotes. So maybe he's saying that he's written lots of other stuff way back when. And then maybe he started writing again later. Or maybe he's been writing like nonfiction stuff all this time and then he decided to write a fiction thing or I don't know exactly what that means. But Well, he's the one that's always on the, the escape pod main page with like right. movie reviews right. and essays about things mm-hmm. and book reviews. And right. That's impressive. Yeah, that that's, he, that's pretty cool. Now, if we hadn't chased him away from our site, <laughs> would he be doing all that sort of thing for us or... I understand you never wanted to clutter up our main page with things like that and that's why we have the blog separate. Mm, that's you you're thinking of oh i love clutter i'm one of those people that bottles my urine uh, keeps it shelves mason jars no uh, too much to yeah. share sorry um do, do we still have a robot to cut things up? he's not around <laughs> wow holy cow when did we lose the robot he's running a 5k this evening he just asked if he could have the night off because it's the midnight 5k where you dress up and glow-in-the-dark stuff, and he, he was hoping to win the best costume. Do they do that? Midnight glow-in-the-dark sure. races? Sure, yeah. Okay, well, I uh, have derailed the conversation. What I was going to say is just I, I'm surprised about the, the one of the first stories that he wrote because, and, and I'm always surprised when you meet somebody who knew that they wanted to be a writer when they were four or when they were 10 or when they were 26 or whatever the deal is because there, there were so many things I wanted to be. Uh huh. You know, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to be James Bond. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a radio DJ. There were there were so many things that I I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to work, like work for comics. I wanted to be a voiceover guy in cartoons. 
But as life continues, you have your options narrowed down and, and you find out that you're not as good as somebody else. Like I remember you were big into sports in high school. And by the time you were a man, you would put away some of those dreams because you met people that could kick the ball harder or punch the guy faster or throw yeah. the ball through the thing that's got netting and, and a, a uh -huh. wire rim. Yeah, tell me more. And a, a board uh -huh. that the ball bounces back off of that's sometimes glass, but more likely plastic now. Uh-huh, okay. Am I wrong on this? Well, when did you... Because you, Now, I, I know that this is a personal question, but... How long is it? How long have you known you wanted to be a writer? Do you want to be a writer? <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> There was, I mean, I don't know that I knew, knew like you and probably everybody kind of wants to do all sorts of different things, but they eventually pick one of them. And yeah, I mean, I, I want to be this, that and the other thing, but a writer was definitely one of them. I remember there was a time when I was fairly young where I actually took a whole bunch of paper and I cut it into paperback book size and I got the typewriter out and I was going to make this book my cool boy. And my daughter does the same thing now, even. She's always making books. She's like, okay, I want you to mail it off to publishers, Dad. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'll get right on that. You did submit it to <laughs> the... Asimov. Uh, yeah, it, she, she's had two things on Asimov's. No, that's Josh. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay, I, but I'm sorry, sorry. When was this? The the cutting the, the paper? I would where, say... Where, 31, was, 36, where, where about? Yeah. Because I've seen it around... <laughs> And the handwriting is real. Wait, maybe that was your daughter's. I would say I was probably 10 when I did that. The, the sad thing is I didn't really know that I wanted to be a writer or what kind of writing even that I wanted to do for sure until after I graduated college, I would say. What was it that decided you? And I know this is not about Josh's story, but I haven't read Josh's story. so I believe you were the one that actually read the entirety of Josh's story. Oh, well, you caught me in a lie. I, I, was, I was hoping that people would ignore that when was this and what was it that made you decide you wanted to be a writer i'm not really sure i mean i, I kind of always like telling stories we've said on here many times that we were both film majors and that was kind of uh, one of the things that i decided of all the things that i like doing making videos and films and stuff like that was maybe something that i could turn into a job because when i was younger what i really wanted to do was find a way to do something that i love as my job so that going to work wouldn't suck it wouldn't be a chore it would be a pleasure because you do the thing you love the most and so who cares very few people actually get that yeah but it didn't, it, they're the lucky ones the ones that get to go and say you know what i got the best job ever yeah it didn't totally work out for me i mean i'm in a field of a, a sort of a way that i kind of do what i love but not necessarily because of what i wanted to do was tell stories and i guess news is kind of telling stories but it's a very 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 truncated way of doing it and they're all true ish the, let's go back to the the one of the first three stories that he wrote if you submitted one of the first three stories that you wrote let's, let's say it was to the dune steve and you knew it would be accepted would you even submit it how good are those first three stories that you wrote uh you've probably read them all to tell you the truth they're not great but you wrote stories in high school you would talk about the stories that you yeah, wrote. Yeah, that's true. I did write some. I don't know if I could even find them and tell you how good they are or not. I don't know if I ever finished anything in high school. Maybe one or two. There was a. I did have a creative writing class that I took in high school, which for the most part was a sit around and talk class. There was no writing hardly at all that was ever done. I did, I think, write two stories for that. And one of them the teacher put up on the wall because it was so great. <laughs> And that's uh, next week's episode, something by Big Anklevich, teacher put up on the wall. That's right. Uh, I wonder if I still have that somewhere. I had to look through boxes and see if I can find some of those old stories. But yeah, those old stories are not good. One of them was the one, uh, something out there. Spock! Which I rewrote and we did as a incentive episode. But you rewrote it using the template of the original story from years and years ago, or you just rewrote it? from what you remembered i rewrote it from what i remembered I and that's probably seen it. the best way to go right yeah you can't say well this is a story i wrote when i was 16 <laughs> or or did you in that episode i don't i think uh i would probably mentioned that i did in the first place but that i rewrote it for this i don't know 
really the first three stories that I wrote would probably, I would call the ones that I did right as we finished college. I graduated with my film degree and discovered that it got me nowhere in the world. And I went to work at a telemarketing place (laughs) because I had to pay rent somehow. I was writing a fair amount when I'd get home. My wife, I think, was not getting home from work until hours later. And so I would come home and just sit and write. And I wrote them by hand on a notebook because we had no computer yet. I was still too poor, uh, as you might guess, because working in a telemarketing job is not going to make you rich. They did have computers at the telemarketing place that you could use on your time off to work on your classwork or whatever, I guess, because a lot of people that worked there were still students. And so I took those stories after I wrote them and typed them up on their computers. And, uh, yeah, I saw... I'm trying to think of what it was. A, a outline of a movie which sounded really similar to the story that I wrote. The first one that I wrote, which you may remember, was one about a guy who was on the space station. And uh, nuclear war happens on Earth while he's in the space station. And he's, like, trapped in space by himself. And what does he do? That was my first story that I wrote as... That I would say my first story, but... I'm kind of rambling a whole lot here, aren't I? Well, no, 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 no. I asked the question, and you're answering it instead of saying, well, let's not talk about that. And so at what point did you say, this is what I want to do? Now, I've worked telemarketing as well, and it's soul-sucking. It is. I've, I've done it at more than one company, and the turnover is like 80%. Yeah. People burn out, like in a week. People are like, oh, screw this. Forget this. And so... Knowing that you have to do that because you've got a family or because you've got obligations or whatever, I can see that being one of those things where you just moan when the alarm goes off in the morning (laughs) and was writing an escape, a way of having power, a way of choosing your own destiny, a way of doing something with your time in that seat that didn't horribly scar you internally yeah it was it was it was a nice release. I don't know if it was because of the job that I had or not. We've talked before about the screenwriting class that we had together. And I swear I did the worst work of my life in that screenwriting class. And I don't, I don't know why, what it was, but I, you would think being in film class would have made me creatively blossom or awaken or something like that. But instead, when I was in film school, I felt so much more creatively stifled than anything else. I joined in with what other people were doing a lot. I was part of many productions, and I edited, gosh, dozens of student films. Well, you were known as the guy, the go-to guy. Strangers would come up to you and say, (laughs) I don't know you, but will you edit this? Will you spend seven hours of your free time in the middle of the night and have this done for me on Monday? Yeah, they'd be like, I'll buy you a pizza if you do. That's how I fed myself in college. I, I never went to the grocery store. I just edited. I had a sign that said, we'll edit for food. I did a lot of that, but I, I never felt free to tell my own stories. Here and there, I had a couple of things where I wrote something that wasn't complete crap, and I would try and make it. And Like that Squirt Gun movie that you and I worked on it had several failed attempts at trying to get off the ground. We actually shot that on film at one point. Yeah, we did try that. We tried all sorts of things. I think that was just a trick to get somebody to try and do it with me, and it still didn't work. But yeah, it was weird that I would feel so creatively stifled in such a creative environment, but I totally did. And then once I was done with film school, all of a sudden I had story ideas in my head and I started writing them down. And suddenly I realized, why in the crap did I do film? I should have done creative writing. That should have been what I was doing for my degree, but I didn't. And I guess creative writing degree wouldn't have gotten me any farther in the world than a a film degree turned out to. Once I was free of that, I was just like, oh, here, I, here's what I can do. And I can tell stories this way. I should have done it all along. I love to write stories like this. I've always done it ever since I was young. You know, I, I would write stories this way and should have done it that way in the first place. Done it like a novel. Read dozens of novels. I've never seen a screenplay in my life. And why did I go with film? So, yeah, I don't know. I guess it was right then. I thought that's what I need to do. I wish that from that moment I'd stuck with writing. I wrote about three stories at that point that I thought were all pretty good. And, you know, they were beginning stories. I probably wouldn't pick them up now and say, yeah, this is great. 
cut and print. But maybe the original <laughs> idea was so good that you could turn him into a Asimov story or a Doonstief story, whatever, like Josh did. <laughs> you gotta love I mean, because we, we didn't read his first draft. That's belief, true. That's true. Or what was it called before? Belief? I support... I, for one, welcome our, our, our new robot, robot overlords. overlords. Something like that. I, I'm terrible with the memes. I don't know, but then you you had the bug, and I, I remember you sent me. Did you send me all three of those stories? I probably did. And to me, it was neat to have a friend that was writing. And I've had a couple of friends that wanted to be writers, and then when I moved to LA, I met a bunch of people that all wanted to be writers. And you know, the thing that they all have in common is that they don't write anymore. <laughs> but you didn't stop. I mean, you I caught you right at the beginning rather than at the end of your dreams. That's true. And so I... I yeah, I started writing. I wrote three whole stories and then I just stopped. I don't know why I stopped or why I gave up on that, why I didn't keep writing all the time like I was doing for about three or four months. I wrote those three stories really quickly, then petered out and stopped doing it had i kept going doing it as at the pace i was doing then i'd be somewhere i could have been a contender instead of a bum which is yeah, what you are that's what i am now okay well i sorry if that was a derailment should <laughs> i not have asked that? Bit. no it's fine i'm sure uh, the people who actually listen to the show will perhaps find it interesting the, the others that have long turned it off won't care because they're gone that's fine and now, now we will, we will announce the real reason for this episode. Our invasion will begin in earnest. <laughs> now that the unworthy have left the room. <laughs> the other thing that I got out of the story, well, there's two things. But the first is how hard it was to like the ex-wife character. <laughs> wow. Dude, and I, I, I don't know that Jennifer is Adam's wife, but she has the same last name. It seems like that that would be a hard part to give to your wife. She was just <laughs> seriously. A, she was awful. And that's something that you get time and time again in fiction when you've got a main character who is your point of view character. You'll find the people that oppose him, well, they're not your main character. We don't see their internal monologue. We don't see their motivations. And she might have been a totally decent person when she wasn't around her ex. But when she was around her ex, she was the devil. <laughs> and so, and, you know, maybe that's part of the definition of an ex, fill in the blank. If if they weren't the devil, you'd still be with them. But boy, it was just so hard, you know, with the kids and the tug of war and the how dare you. And I know what's really going on. And the well, that was one thing that stuck with me. Yeah, definitely. That was a, a, a tough thing to deal with. You know, it, it, that conflict, it makes you feel really bad for the children of that divorced family. And I guess that's kind of a common thing for divorced parents in general. I mean, it's always kind of a, a tug of war. And often kids manage to make something out of it, you know, to play one against the other kind of a thing. And, oh, yeah, dad bought me a computer for Christmas. And then the mom's like, oh, yeah, well, I'm getting you two computers. With dad's money. <laughs> that kind of thing is hard. See, I never had to deal with that. My parents were happily married up until the point that my mom passed away. And so I, I experienced any of this kind of stuff that I know from television shows where parents are divorced and, and whatnot. But didn't a lot of your friends have come from divorced families or? Not really, to tell All you right. the truth. I don't know. I guess the divorce rate wasn't as high in the, the 80s as it is now. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is uh, the way that the story ends. You can interpret it. You can assume that everything goes really well. I mean, that's how I assumed it because it was a positive story in the way that it ends. I believe, you know, I'm a, this guy had faith. And ultimately, I, at least I assume, that faith is vindicated. But uh, we don't know for sure. And they they could have a, a book. That, yeah, How to Cook for 40 Humans. And, right. And, to, and, and there's lots of stories that are like that. There's like, I'm going to let the audience decide what happens. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, there have been many stories where I, I just hate it. I hate not having things answered. But, you know, there are other people that, that just like that because it's like, oh, I get to be part of the story. 
because I get to determine how it ends. What did you think about the ending? I liked the ending myself. I know that often you uh, bring up our, our quote from our friend who said, this story that you wrote ends right where I wanted it to begin. He says that a lot. And I feel that when I watch movies or short stories that are similar to this one. I think it really just depends on what the story is about. You know what I mean? You have a character who's going through something and there's like a side thing. Like in this case, you've got aliens coming. What are the aliens like? Are they waiting to eat humans? Are they three-headed monsters with big pointy teeth like this? You know, you don't know what the aliens are like, but... It's an audio podcast, though. (laughs) You don't know what the aliens are like, but in this case, it's not necessarily... That's not what the story's about. It's not about the aliens and what they're like. I mean, if you kept going, you would be past the ending, really. Unless there was some kind of special thing about the aliens where something happens. But what the story is about is this guy who believes in these things. He had to put them away to grow up and go on. And then comes his opportunity to exercise those beliefs. And everybody in the world fears it. But this guy, he believes And he gets to prove his belief and he gets to actually use that despite all the odds and everybody saying, you can't win, Rocky. He does it anyways. And so, you know, the story isn't about what the aliens are like or what they're going to do, why they came here. He gets to find out. It's kind of like you're... You wrote a story once, I believe it was called Cursed Toby. Oh, yes. Which was about a kid and he gets that opportunity. He gets to be somebody special and he gets to go off with the aliens. What is he going to do when he goes off with the aliens? We don't know. We don't find out. It's not the story. The story is that he's actually worthwhile, even though he's a weirdo. That being weird is what made him something that the aliens wanted to take with them to their new world because weirdos taste better. Hey! (laughs) We don't really know, you know? It's not necessarily what the story's about. And sometimes it is what the story's about. And people choose to leave it up to you anyways, and then that's when it's a problem, when it ends before you get to find out, okay, hey, no, the story was about what happened to his wife, and he needs to free his wife from the possession of the demon, and you, you, you stopped before he did that. Oh, we can pass on this one. Send it back to Nicole. So, you know, I think that's the difference, really. You know, it's, it's a sideshow, the aliens are. Oh, you've given this a lot of thought. <laughs> I've written a few stories that end this way, and I think you've even told me that at the end of some of them, where you're like, Mah, this story ended where I wanted it to begin. F you, Big Anklevich. And I'm just like, no, the story's not about that. Well, maybe I missed the point on those. Or maybe you played up the sideshow a little more than the, than I should the A have. story. And, and, and I don't know. I'm not thinking of any particular stories right now that you did that on. But I've done it too, where it's like, well, yeah, that's not I like Curse Toby. I know why the aliens were here and why they took the best <laughs> and the brightest of us. And I even started writing because a sequel. Because they taste better. <laughs> you monster. <laughs> and I even started writing a sequel that examines that but if i had published that story and if people had really really liked it and then you get the sequel which answers all those questions there might have been a lot of people that were frustrated do you remember close encounters of the third kind came out in 77 and it ends with the mothership coming down and richard dreyfus goes in credits Mm -hmm. then Spielberg and Columbia Pictures wanted to re-release it later and they said well, we, and, and there were scenes that Spielberg couldn't shoot because he either ran out of time or didn't have budget or uh, I don't know why and they said well sure we'll give you the money to shoot these scenes as long as you show us what happens when Richard Dreyfus goes into the mothership and he was just like oh geez no I want I want the audience to just imagine and they're like okay but he ended up shooting the special edition of Close Encounters, which ends with what you see inside the mothership. But it bothered him for years and years. So he changed what Richard Dreyfuss sees in the mothership to walkie-talkies. <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, when it finally came time to put it out on DVD, he kept to the parts that the extra budget had allowed him to shoot, but ended it with the original ending. Although I think you can watch as deleted scenes, 
what the, the spaceship was like. And, and so I, I, the point I was trying to make is I'm sure that there were people who saw the 77 version and then saw the 80 version or whatever it was that the special edition came out and were disappointed because they're like, oh, we're going to see this again because this time we get to see what he sees inside the ship. And they're like, oh. Well, that's it. I, I wanted there to be like... It's like, oh, it was just many chlorians in there? Oh, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> because whatever they had created in their mind was either too big or, you know, too different or they missed the point or, or maybe it didn't matter what you saw inside the ship because it was a new beginning for Richard Dreyfuss's character. Just like Greg in this story, you know, his faith had been vindicated because, you know, he worked really, really hard to get to Devil's Tower, right? Isn't that what it's called? And then he, he is rewarded because only the ones that passed all the tests got to see the ship and go into the ship and be among the chosen. And that's what the story was about. Mm -hmm. there, there are things like that where people demand a sequel. They demand a follow-up. I want to know what happens I want to go to E.T.'s planet or I want to know, you know, fill in the blank. What happens next? What happens after the DeLorean flies and disappears? And then when they get it, a lot of times people are really disappointed. Right. You know, the, the Matrix sequel or clamoring for an Indiana Jones 4. Dang it, we need an <laughs> Indiana Jones 4. Or there are three other examples that are even more clamored for that people just, ah, shoot. No, that's not what we wanted. Oh, dang it. Why did you give us what we asked for? And I, I, I don't know. He didn't say anything in this author's note about why he ended it where he did. Mm -hmm. But my guess is, like you said, what the story was about, he expressed. And then there was no more need for more details. I, I, I don't know. I'm not him. I, I didn't write the story myself. But it's fun that we have author's notes and we can have the actual writer tell us whatever he chooses to tell us about the story. There was one that I wrote about a babysitter who she always tends the kids at this big house. And one day there's a door in the hallway that had never been there before. There was a door, a door. It said yeah. the pusher and the door is locked and she does all that she can to open this door and find out what's on the other side. And then I ended it the story with the parents coming home and finding the babysitter. And she had opened this door that she wasn't supposed to open. And I purposely didn't, explain what she had seen when she opened this door and i was terrified that somebody somewhere would be like oh f you man how dare you the whole point was this door and what she sees on the other side and you robbed us of it or whatever so i thought it would be fun to write that scene but leave it out of the story so that i could say well i know i wrote it uh -huh. but that's not what the story was about and I've never shared that story with anyone because I know that it's a giant cop out. It's a giant rip off. And then people would be like, hey, that story sucked. And so do you. <laughs> and now I'm going to kick the crap out of you. Well, they, they say that anyways, though. So. Oh, OK. Well, then might as week well share after it. next, <laughs> my story will be on the Doomsday. Might as well. Really? I mean. <laughs> All right. So that's Belief by Josh Roseman. If you have any other questions or you want to talk more about belief, we've got a forum. You can go ahead and visit that. There's a little link on the side of our page. You can go to it. You can join it. You can post in the post story discussion that we do on every episode, or you can make up whatever other crap you want to talk about. We all just talk about stuff. You can join in the movie quotes guessing game, which is the longest running thread we've got. So check that out. We are going to veer in a completely different direction now because Rish, last week, just got back from his annual pilgrimage to Mecca. Geek Mecca. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's San Diego, which is similar to Mecca in that geeks go there. You have to cross the desert. Yes, you do have to go across the desert to get to it, to the Comic-Con. Tell us about Comic-Con, Rish. How was it this year? For the most part, I thought it was really, really good this year. I had yeah. a very positive experience. And uh, was there any chance that you were coming with me at any point? <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to say. Money is always an issue. I don't have a lot of it. And I have a lot of people that want it from me. So. Dealers. Yes. Pimps. Dealers, pushers, pimps, children, wives. One wife, actually. <laughs> I haven't gotten that far yet. But it's funny because... My wife said after I was telling her, oh, yeah, 
Rich just got back from going to Comic Con, and he he was saying this and that, and she was asking me about the Firefly panel. She said, "Oh yeah, they're having a tenth anniversary." I heard. I don't know where she would hear this. It must have been on Perez Hilton or something. That's the only site she seems to read frequently. Wait, sorry, Perez Hilton would care about something like Comic Con? I don't know. Did one of the Kardashians ever appear in an Did, episode of Firefly? He. Seems to talk about everything. Maybe it's because Nathan Fillion's castle guy now, and so he's worth talking about in some way. I'm not sure. I don't know how she knew about it. She's like, oh, how come you didn't go? And I'm just like, huh? That was an option? <laughs> yeah. I was just like, what, you're asking me? Weren't you the one that said you can't go or something like that? Or you can't win Rocky or whatever it was? Nothing is over. Nothing. <laughs> So, yeah, I was kind of surprised, and she was saying that next year I should go and take our son with us, and I just thought, yeah, I don't know. I've been to a couple of Comic-Cons, and they're ordeals, man. We could go on a 50-mile hike, and it would be less of an ordeal for the poor boy than going to a Comic-Con, because at least in a 50-mile hike, you know, you have enough space to walk and enjoy yourself, whereas this is like going through the cattle chute on your way to the slaughterhouse. I've stayed at the same motel for the last three years. And the first thing I do every night when I get back to my hotel is I fill up the bathtub to soak my feet (laughs) because they hurt so bad. And, you know, they're swollen and blistered and smell like, well, like like Comic-Con, actually. (laughs) But I would say it's no place for a child, except there are children everywhere. Yeah, there there. usually are. And I don't know how... See, I was thinking, okay, maybe we could take him. But if that were the case, she would have to come too, really. Because I'm not just going to send him off. Like, he's going to want to go to different panels than me. He's not going to be so interested in seeing... The remake of Deliverance panel. Right. He's not going to be as interested in going to the human centipede panel as me, (laughs) but he is probably going to want to see like the Phineas and Ferb panel, which I would go to. There was a Phineas and Ferb panel. Oh, I'm sure sure there was. You probably got to meet Dan Povemeyer and Swampy Marsh at it, I I bet. You got to service Swampy Marsh. (laughs) He would want to go to some of those other kind of things. He probably wouldn't be like, oh, there's a Battlestar Galactica panel. Oh, I've never seen the show. Please, let's go to it. You're dating yourself so (laughs) much. Yeah, but that was the last time, right? There. It was. It was like, oh, there's a Firefly panel. Oh, you don't let me watch Firefly yet because I don't know a whole lot about space hookers. If it's time you've begun. Well, he's oh, not going to be as into I it. I hear you. And and I'm sure not going to send him off. Oh, oh, you go to the Phineas and Ferb and I'll go over here to the uh, Human Centipede panel and uh, we'll meet back here later. Because, dude, he'd be beaten and robbed and raped and dead by the time the hour was up. See, that's funny that you should mention that because Kevin Smith, he always ends the Saturday, you know, with a QA. and a And he talked about that he had brought his daughter, Harley, to Comic-Con this year. And this was the first year that she had her own agenda of the things that she wanted to go to. Uh-huh. And he's like, all right, go off and, and do them. And he was a little bit worried about for the exact same reason that, that you were. But then he thought... Of all the places in the world, where is she going to be safest? And it's like, there's 150,000 people here who believe that with great power, there must come great responsibility. (laughs) And and yeah, he just talked about that. And he's like, she's safe. Okay. I don't know if I could take the the same faith that he had. You know, it's funny. A a friend of mine once, uh, my roommate back in college, Rob, he once was telling a story about how he was at a Dave Matthews concert. And his friend lost his wallet. And he's like, oh, crap. I'm so screwed. I'm never, you know. And he's like, no, dude, just go. They got lost and found over there. And he's like, with all the people here that believe in karma, there is no way that wallet's not going to be there. <laughs> and sure enough, it was. And so, yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe Kevin Smith knows uh, what he's talking about. And these people be like, stop, evildoer, you cannot rape that child, I will say. And all the, all the <laughs> nerds would come rushing out with their superhero t-shirts on. And Yeah, there's not much rushing out at Comic-Con. But... Yeah, that's true. They would, like, cattle their way over, <laughs> crush the evildoer <laughs> in, in mask. Of course, the poor child would also be crushed, but yeah, them's saw, the breaks. I, I, yeah, I saw a lot of kids, like I said, and most... Striking was there was a child, probably two, maybe one, dressed as Snow White, a female child. 
And instead of being held by her mother, her mother is taking her by the hand and walking through the main hall with this child. And I was just like, that kid's never going to see three because (laughs) you were jostled and pushed and molested and stepped on and slugged as a grown man constantly through that whole hall. And they see you. Yeah, that's the thing, man. You can't see. I actually did that just the other day. I was walking along in a fairly busy area and I had my mug in my hand. My uh, bi- I have a big like 50 ounce mug and I had it in my hand. I was walking along and whack, I nailed this kid in the head with this mug. Now that, wait, I, is this the same mug that caused you to crash? Yes, your- yes, that same one that caused me to crash my car. I bashed a kid over the head with it because I didn't see it down below eye level. And I was just like, oh, sorry. Drink mug. Right? Of the dam, And yeah, it's, that was like how crowded the Yukon territory is compared to what the crowd is like in Comic-Con. It's a uh, hundred thousand times more crowded in Comic-Con. So how can a child survive? I don't know. Well, I complain because that one year that we went together and it was super, super crowded, they said a hundred thousand people had shown up. And so I've always used that as the benchmark, that 100,000 people show up to Comic-Con. And this year it was 153,000. That's once again as many people, right? Right. Wow, that th- there could be that many people. Not getting laid. That many people there stuffed into the exact same space that 100,000 people didn't fit three years ago or whenever that was. That's frightening. Yeah. Man. And it really came to bite me on Friday which was the 13th, uh, Harrison Ford's birthday. And there was a panel for the TV show community with the cast on and uh, the 10th anniversary Firefly panel in the same room on the same day. And so I went there first, first thing when the doors opened, before the doors even opened, because there was a lady that let us in 10 minutes early. The doors opened at 9.30. I was in there at 9.20 rushing toward this line. And the line was so long when I got into it that there was no chance to get into either of these panels. And I spent, you know, I wasted some of my morning just hoping, not having any idea, that there were miles of people (laughs) ahead of me. And at one point, the line really, really started to move. And I assumed that that meant that the community panel, people were being herded into the community panel, and that the line was finally moving. And the reason it was moving was that their ushers or security people or whatever were going through the line backwards telling people to go home, telling people you're not going to make it. Are you here for community? Are you here for whatever panel is after that? Are you here for Firefly? None of you are going to make it in. And sorry, it's full. You're not going to make it. And for a moment, I foolishly figured, well, I'll just stay in the line because not everybody that likes community is going to like Firefly. Community is a popular, well, not popular. Community is a show that's on TV right now. And Firefly is a show that was on TV 10 years ago. And so I would imagine the vast majority of people who watch Community don't know Firefly. So they'll leave after the Community panel ends, and I'll get to go in the room. And I expressed this in far fewer words to one of those security guys, and he said, no, 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 you don't understand. Ballroom 20 holds 1,000 people. You're 6,000th in line. Even if everybody in there right now died, you wouldn't get in the room. And that's pretty much all I needed to hear. And I lowered my head and trudged back to Comic-Con. Yeah, you especially wouldn't get in because it would require an army of coroners to get all those people out of the room just to empty a few seats out. And ironically enough, it would smell only slightly worse. (laughs) So my day was ruined. I was just bummed out. The people that got in, because I talked to, there were people with Firefly shirts all through Comic-Con. And I would ask him about the panel because I missed it. What did they announce? What, what, is, is Firefly going on? You know, are they doing direct to Netflix thing? Is Nathan Fillion buying the rights? You know, all this. I, and I, I would ask them and they would say, no, they didn't say anything. Nothing. Nothing was revealed. And I'd say, what time did you get in line? Because I got in line at 920. And they'd be like, yeah, I was in line at quarter to six this morning. Whereas I was in line at 503. I, that boggled my mind that you would require not for Hall H on Saturday, but for something on Friday in Ball Room Twenty How? that didn't start for four more hours. I figured four hours early is enough for me to get into it, and it wasn't. How uh, did they get into line that early? Didn't you have to get inside the building somehow? Because the building is locked, right? I mean, this is not like Hall H where it is outside. 
Well, apparently, you know, there are security people walking around and stuff to guard the place at night. And people just lined up and said, this is the line for community outside. And as soon as the doors open, we're going to file in as a line and nobody's going to get in ahead of us. And security's like, okay, that's fine. And so by the time those doors opened, there were thousands of people ahead of me in the line. I don't know because I wasn't up there. I didn't see how it worked. Huh. But I was there the next day and saw, I saw how that works. So that was a real bummer. And I was depressed and I was just like, what a waste. You know, there are other things that you can do at Comic-Con and lots of panels and things that you can buy. But all of them require sacrificing great amounts of time for the privilege of sacrificing your money right. or watching these panels. And it sucked because my cousin had like a list of things that he wanted me to buy from Mattel and Hasbro and that. And unless you were right there at 920 in the morning, you couldn't get any of this stuff. And uh, probably not even 920 because like the vendors could get in at seven or some crazy number like that. And they can buy it all. Anyhow, that was the real bummer. The day before Thursday was the first day I went and there was an Expendables 2 panel. Mm -hmm. In Hall H. And I showed up like 40 minutes before that started and walked right in. Just like the very first year I went to Comic-Con. It was like, yeah, there was no huge herd of people as cattle. And that Expendables panel was really neat because it had Stallone and Schwarzenegger together. And they made fun of one another and tried to one-up one another. And then that to me was really amusing. And uh, Dolph Lundgren was in there and he didn't get to say a damn thing. That's as it should be. Oh, come on. He was He-Man. He taught us. What did he teach us? <laughs> he taught Don't us say. to not say goodbye, but to say good journey. Didn't he teach us that? <laughs> if, if more people knew not to say goodbye, but to say good journey, this world would be exactly the way it is now. Just people would say that. I bet you Schwarzenegger said, hey, Stallone, remember when I said I'd kill you last? Yeah, yeah, Arnold. Yeah, you said you'd do uh, that. Why? I lied. Well, you know what? <laughs> Uh, and that was a funny thing. Schwarzenegger was a real ham. And he, you know, everything was, I, I'm going to be funny. And I'm going to do, and somebody's like, hey, say hasta la vista. And he's like, hasta la vista, baby. Ah, and everybody would applaud. And then the next guy would be like, okay, say I'll be back. And he'd do it. And it's like anybody else would be like, okay, no, no, no. I already did the other thing. Wait, ask a question. Don't just stand here in line and ask me to do a line for my movie. But he did. It's not a tumor. <laughs> and he did um, <laughs> put the cookie down and welcome to the party, Richter. Seriously, a whole procession of people asking Schwarzenegger to say catchphrases. I, I don't know. The catchphrase thing sucks. We've talked about that. <laughs> and because we were children, we didn't realize that it sucks. But, oh, it does. But the, the very first time somebody asked that, there was a guy dressed as a Viking. And he came up and he says, I have a question for Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he was doing a, an Arnold impersonation dressed as a Viking. And he says, I was wondering if you could impart your wisdom and tell us what is best in life. And people started to applaud. And I was like, wait, what did he say? I couldn't understand with the accent. And Arnold says, oh, yes, I, I think I know to crush your enemies. <laughs> To see them driven before you and to hear the lamentation of the world. And people went crazy, man. It was so cool that A, he remembered that line. And two, that he knew that that's what the guy wanted to hear. And maybe people ask him that all the time. But to me, I was just like, wow, that is neat. Uh, it was it was fun to see those guys. And, and I don't know about Expendables. You never saw the first one. Did I didn't. You? Did you have any interest in seeing that? I don't know. Probably not. It seems like action movies like those... They're one of those things that I put behind me long ago, and they don't interest me anymore. I don't know. I, I really enjoyed watching Schwarzenegger movies and many of the Stallone movies as well back in the day. But, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, by the time Van Damme was along, and I was just like, no thanks. I'm done with that kind of really dumb stuff. Here's the thing, and I, I know that I'm taking up valuable time, but Expendables 1 was not a great movie. But it did have a couple of moments that were really, really cool. And then just the idea of seeing all these guys together uh -huh. was neat. And Stallone, he might have been spinning as well. You never know. But in the panel, he was talking about the, the, the benefit of a sequel is that you've made this one movie and you're able to sit back and say, this worked and this didn't work so well. And, oh, this part was really cool. And make your second movie way more of the things that worked. Then didn't. And so he said, you know, this, this movie's going to be way better. You know, I don't know why he sounds like Travolta. It's weird. 
he said that this one would be way better because of that. And uh, I'm curious to see if he's right because there were two or three moments that were cool. And I think it was you I was telling about. There's this moment at the end of Expendables where like this main brute bad guy fights Stallone and Stallone loses just like really, really badly. And then his buddies have to come and, and like rescue him or whatever. And I just waited for the rematch for the time when Stallone would get to fight this guy. And this time he'd learned something or whatever. And he was able to beat this guy despite the guy being faster and stronger and younger. It's weird. It's, it's starting to sound like another movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they didn't do that. They just let Stallone lose and let somebody else take out this dude. Like, wow, that, that shows like a sense of like humility or, or something on Stallone's part that he wouldn't, his ego wouldn't say, well, I have to get the last word. I have to get, I have to be able to kick this guy's head in now. Otherwise, people are going to think I'm a loser. It was just neat. That's, that's really weird. <laughs> he, uh, and to me, that was one of the two or three things that I thought really worked in Expendables. There was a scene with Mickey Rourke where he has this monologue, like a really moving monologue that didn't belong in Expendables at all, but it was really neat. And then there was this stuff with Dolph Lundgren in there, which was really cool too. In, in the same way as the Stallone thing where they let Dolph Lundgren be really unheroic and human. And, uh, and I was just like, wow, Dolph Lundgren. Wow. How come he got a character arc? So it was just, it was neat. <laughs> Anyhow, this one has way more people in it. And like Van Damme is the bad guy and Chuck Norris is in this one. And Bruce Willis and Schwarzenegger all get to be, you know, their parts are much more beefed up. And I hope that it's really, really good. And I don't know that it will be, but we'll see. I, I will go to it and it would be fun to drag you to it, but I'm not going right. to do that. Anyhow, the thing with Comic-Con for me is there's there's two things that I really like. And the first is that you get to be around tons of people that share your love for certain things. You know, you love Spider-Man? These 800 people love Spider-Man. He's like, you love Kermit the Frog? These 800 people love Kermit the Frog. You, you know, love so. child molesting? Well, these 1,000 people love that too. That was That's not where we were going. That was a different convention. <laughs> and that one's in September, so you haven't missed it. Oh, good. Well, okay, maybe that's fair to say that there are bad people everywhere, but I, I don't <laughs> think so, so much with some of these guys. I mean, okay. That's not where I was going with it. That was just supposed to be a joke. Come on, take the joke and move on. People on Facebook don't think the things I say are funny. That's because they're not. How dare you, sir? <laughs> I like being around like-minded people or people that are passionate about the same things that I'm passionate about. And, you know, that was neat. I had conversations in line with people about Star Wars or about the Expendables or about... About bronies. I didn't talk to any bronies, but I did see some people with brony t-shirts and huge erections. <laughs> and so there was that. But you also get to see people in costume or whatever. I mean, they go all out to express how much they love whatever it might be the ones that won't pose for pictures that always puzzles me because it's like well wait you put all of this effort into standing out from everybody else and you don't want the attention <laughs> and you can explain it to me if you know why that would be but it's just to me it's 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 like you know i got a facial tattoo nobody look at my facial hey stop looking at my facial tattoo why did you get the facial tattoo? So people would look at it. Anyhow, that's part one of my conversation about Comic-Con. I just don't want the episode to be super long, but I wanted to talk about Hall H and all the panels that I went to, because that's the second thing that I really love about Comic-Con is all this movie news and these celebrities getting up and talking about movies. Uh -huh. So if you can bear with me, I will talk to you about that in the next episode. Okay. Okay. All right. So yeah, thanks to Josh Roseman for his story belief. And thanks to Adam Gifford for producing the story belief. Great stuff, everybody. Nice work. And uh, yeah, thanks to the listeners for listening, especially those of you who are still listening. That was very nice of you. Yeah, th thanks a lot. And uh, hopefully we will be back very soon. I, I think it'll be much shorter a period from this episode to the next episode than it has been recently because I finished mine that I produced. We've got another story that someone else produced that they've gotten to us just now or about to get to us just now and so hopefully things will work out i mean we even talked about getting together more than once this week because we <laughs> didn't get together last week and we didn't get together the week before so so yeah we'll see you again next time folks thanks for listening yeah and 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 don't stop believing 
Oh, we don't do that stuff anymore. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. you could say why not, though. Shoot, he's not here. Good night. See ya. At the Dune Steve, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like, so if you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. That's it. I'm out of here. Take two. I love to fart. I love to fart. <laughs> Loud and long and clear. The more I fart, <laughs> the more I'm a merry a me. What? There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.